the turning points that are depicted in these four films are uh, particular to the towns that the films are about, but the notion of turning points is much broader than that. Uh, I think that every community uh, has experienced some sort of a transformative or a pivotal moment, some sort of a moment that has brought out its character and uh, compelled it to adapt. And one thing that I hope people can get from these films is to reflect about how their own community might have changed or how their own community might be changing at this very moment in ways that they hadn't even thought of. Before the sign, you would tell people where you worked, and they were like, oh, there's a school for the deaf in the Kansas City area? Where is that? The signs that we've had on the interstate has been such a powerful statement to the world that you're entering a very special place here, and the uh, vehicular traffic on I-35 has taken note and have stopped and wanted to learn more about Kansas School for the Deaf and that was really the genesis for the Deaf Cultural Center. In the friendly Midwestern town of Olathe, Kansas, a cultural wellspring has appeared over the last century and a half. It's not oil that has been struck or an emerging market that has been cornered, rather an investment that has been made in the lives of deaf people across the globe. Since its inception, the Kansas School for the Deaf has provided care and education to deaf students, and with every year that has passed, the support of the community has grown. That support was the inspiration for building a deaf cultural center in Olathe, one of only three in the entire world. The resulting opportunities and awareness wouldn't have been possible without a pair of highway signs that have helped to spread the word about what Olathe has to offer. There are hearing people that stop by and say, you know, I think I had a deaf uncle, and I think he attended the school, and we would look up information, and we've been able to find quite a bit of genealogical information for folks. The reason I really wanted to visit was because I had a family connection to the school and grew up hearing about my great-grandfather, and I was really interested to see what the school was about. To me, it was interesting to think about learning about the school from a different perspective. There was a photo that the director found for us by chance, and it was unmistakable that it was him. It's kind of an unusual photo outside, and um, he's sitting with some other people in the grass. It was amazing to get that, you know, more information. I came away with a lot more understanding about what his life and his experience must have been like here. Um, AKSD. We're really seeing an evolution in what the Deaf Cultural Center can mean to so many people. And it's filling the need of what's out there in the community, both the hearing community as well as the Deaf community. There's a lot of people out in the community that have hearing loss. Uh, it's an amazing number across the country, an estimated anywhere from 38 to 42 million people. Probably the biggest challenge is helping some members of the hearing community understand that being deaf doesn't mean that you can't participate, that you don't have opinions about things, that you're not part of the community at large. The main thing is providing a means of communication. To me, that is probably the key element 
for um, any child. Olathe and Kansas School for the Deaf grew up together. They were founded close to the same time, and the fabric of Olathe is intertwined with the history of KSD. Diversity is a great source of strength for Olathe, and Olathe has known diversity since its beginning. And in fact, we're so proud to be known as one of America's most deaf-friendly cities. The culture of understanding within Olathe the opportunities afforded to students like Jeannie, and the chance to better acquaint ourselves with the people who paved the way for all this change are not things that happen overnight. They are precedents that have been set through hard work and dedication to the ideas pioneered by the Kansas School for the Deaf. Those ideas have been invisible to much of the community, but sometimes the world just has to be shown a sign. Having the sign posted on the highway, bringing people into Olathe and into the school as well as into the Deaf Cultural Center has been an avenue for opening up that door. I've learned a lot about what it means to be deaf and it's funny, I think I've learned a lot more about what it means to be hearing as well. The Deaf Cultural Center truly is a central place for people to come and get information about a community that exists in every community around the world. We still have people that stop by and we often ask them, uh, what brought you into the Deaf Cultural Center? Well, they saw the sign on the highway. neighbor called us in the middle of the night and said, we better get out of here. It's dirty, stinking. It had everything in it. It had dead animals in it. Lots and lots of straw, debris, um, mud. And that mud is terrible. <laughs> the mud, it was just very muddy. The water was moving so fast. I was gonna try to walk through it, but I couldn't. It was running so fast. From Dodd City, that water was eight foot deep. When South Dog. There was so much debris. You have to think of all the water that came down that river before it ever got to Kinsley. An awesome mess, that's what it was. Kinsley, Kansas, a river town situated just north of the Arkansas River and between the Big Coon and Little Coon Creeks. Thanks to its geographic location, the town experienced prosperity throughout the early 1900s. As the nation underwent change, Mother Nature brought along changes of her own. Multiple floods crippled the city of Kinsley over and over again, the worst coming in 1965, causing major problems for the community. This was a nice, thriving little community for many, many years, and it's not now. Every time something comes in here, they check the flood zone and they're not gonna come in because they, they lose everything they got. You can't build in Kinsley unless you raise the property up above the 100-year flood level. So that stops any progress as far as building and, 
and uh, new businesses coming to town. At the very minimal, they'll probably have to raise the haul in a lot of dirt to get the, the site built up above. That still means they're in the floodplain, but the rates are a lot cheaper if you're above. You have so many obstacles that you have to go through uh, to redo your house, to, re to build. The city was considering having a levee built around it to keep the city out of the floodplain. Uh, there was a group of uh, volunteers and active people who worked a year or so at least on, on getting this done. And when it went to vote it, it failed. That would have been an opportunity for Kenzie to basically not had a, an issue with this. Some of the farm people didn't want it because the theory was if you had a dike or levee around the city, then the farmland's going to flood more. Uh, but on the other hand, the farmland will survive the kind of floods we have. You don't like it, but it doesn't happen very often, but there's no usually not any buildings damage with that. But uh, So that failed, and that was probably a significant thing that Kinsley uh, missed a chance on to uh, not have this issue. The decision in 1980 not to build the levee is set in history, and nothing can change that. But rather than wait for federal intervention to help the struggling town, Kinsley citizens have taken matters into their own hands, working on various projects to adapt to floodplain regulation. Marsha Bagby, one of Kinsley's former city managers, has been influential in leading the charge to reinvigorate the struggling community. Marsha and her team have initiated several projects working to bring prosperity back to the town of Kinsley. I've always been aware that the floodplain issue has been a big negative in our community, has uh, stopped potential business development from coming here. I figured that when I had the opportunity, when I became city manager, that I was going to educate myself and learn about the flood issue and find out if anything could be done about it and what those options were. It was emotional because at some points it could be farmers against city. Uh, it, it was hard, but they believed in me. They believed in um, the need to address that issue if we were, if we were gonna continue to be a city and they were very supportive. You have to be proactive for your community. And that is what got Kinsley the recognition, got them the money to help them do these projects, and uh, basically got them the notice. I think that there's still projects that could be done. I know that money limits that, but the map is made so that the more projects that we do, the more land will come out of the floodplain. I am very excited and hope that someday that that comes to fruition. Having the floodplain regulations in place sometimes can be an impediment to people building things they'd like to, but what I want people to understand is, in my time, there's never been anybody who wanted to build something who couldn't. It just simply means the way you build it and perhaps the cost of it will increase somewhat. But we will work with anybody to try to help them build whatever they would like to within our community. Our economy has changed drastically over the last 50 years or so as fewer and fewer people work in the ag economy and so we fight the battle that all small communities are fighting and these floodplain regulations sometimes make that battle even more difficult. The town has not experienced a major flood since the 1970s and in recent years the people of Kinsley have completed a flood mitigation plan that earned national honors this allowed them to revise the flood map, effectively removing parts of the town from the floodplain. Kinsley's citizens are working to renew their town, but it's an uphill battle from this point on. And yet, the resiliency of the citizens holds true. Regardless of what comes next, one thing is certain. A bond forged during times of hardship is one not easily broken. When floods come in, people here in this town all join together. Yeah, they sure do. The town's always been real good about cooperating and things. There is awful lot of things happening in this United States that is a lot worse than living in Kinsley, Kansas. We may fuss among ourselves, but if you need, like most places, we gather together and it's a wonderful place to live. Why do they stay in this town? Because it's my hometown. This is my home. And most of us that live here want to try and stay as long as we can. 
I raised four children here. My wife and I did. We got a home here. We got a good business here. And people's been good to us. I don't think we'd go anywhere else. The little town of Ulysses, Kansas is no stranger to change. It sprouted up in 1885 on the dusty, flat prairie of western Kansas. Cattle drives and railroads brought prosperity. Soon Ulysses was booming with a hotel, six gambling houses, and an opera house. Then the boom turned to bust, and in 1909 city fathers sought to move the entire town two miles west to escape mounting taxes. By then, the dejected population numbered less than 100, down from 1,500 just a few years earlier. A century later, Ulysses was adapting again. The predominantly white population base was shifting. Immigrants from Mexico and Central America were moving to the United States in search of jobs and a better life. Just a few years ago, the white population of Ulysses was 75%. Today, it's less than half. In the next few minutes, we'll see how this modern-day turning point means new hope in the heartland. We came out of the Depression, though. We came from the Dust Bowl into the Salad Bowl. It was the beginning of deep well irrigation. They learned how to drill for water, also oil and gas. Those were the three things that brought life to Southwest Kansas. Then that brought a new wave of migration to Southwest Kansas and to Ulysses in particular. We opened a store here in Ulysses 14 years ago and together we built this store. So we start building customers. When I started living here uh, like 14 years ago, I saw a lot of people, a lot of Hispanic people. It was hard to find products from Mexico, products like to cook and everything. So now we found everything that we need in, at the grocery store, at Walmart. They have every, all the products from Mexico and from other countries. Mi esposo tiene 15 años aquí. Tiene aproximadamente 14 años trabajando en los pozos petroleros. Él es una persona muy respetuosa y es una persona muy responsable en su trabajo. Hay personas que no saben eh, lo que significa trabajar en los pozos petroleros. Somos personas trabajadoras que, que nos interesa que este país también progrese, que somos parte de, de esta comunidad, que aportamos en lo que podemos a la comunidad. My name is Kanye Aragon. I'm from Chihuahua, Mexico, and I've been here for 18 years. En cada momento, quizás a veces pensamos que las celebraciones son banales o que son retrógradas, que no están a la moda, pero no. Nosotros sabemos exactamente de qué manera podemos infundir a nuestros hijos nuestras tradiciones para que continúen ellos con los valores con los que nosotros fuimos criados. Entonces para nosotros es muy importante el continuar, el estar aquí presentes y sobre todo decir estamos fuera de las sombras. When my son started school, it was kind of hard because um, I was learning English. So sometimes they don't have a translator. But now every school has a translator. So every parent, when they, they go to for conference and everything, they explain to them what they need from the students and everything. For our family, it's very important to be able to speak to language because at school they learn English. When they're at my house, we just speak Spanish because I want them to learn the language and I don't want them to lose our culture. We teach them to appreciate this country because this country uh, gives us the opportunity out of 
better life. We always teach him that they need to be polite, behave. We're trying to teach him some values. This community is a good community to be involved with your kids. Eyes right up here. Three. Do we embrace the Mexican culture? And in the beginning, the small farming community, they weren't really excited about having the new people move in. You know, change is hard for people. Sometimes I think it's harder for older people. Children don't see this at all. They've been born together, raised together, schooled together. It disappears. Over a few years, it began to change, and, you know, they began to accept them. And our town's prospering, we're growing. They were seeing a lot of positive things happen. And as farming changes, we don't maybe need as many farm laborers, but we need more bankers, teachers, merchants. So they have evolved over generations. They're living here. They've worked beyond the language barrier. They've sent their children to school. They have grandchildren in school. Some of them have great-grandchildren here now. We all work together. We live together. We don't segregate ourselves. Entonces, para mí ha habido un cambio radical y lo hemos logrado poco a poco. Cuando comenzamos a ir con nuestras marchas a Topica, entonces fue cuando comenzamos a mirar que que la gente había una semilla que podíamos ir alimentando para que esa semilla fuera floreciendo y poco a poco que se fuera reforzando quiénes somos. Yo pienso que hasta las personas que son anglosajonas, tanto como nosotros los inmigrantes, somos personas que siempre estamos buscando un futuro. A pesar de que es una comunidad pequeña, siempre está cambiando. Pete Felton has spent his life shaping native limestone into works of art in the western Kansas town of Hayes. Unlike many artists who grow up in tiny towns, he's never felt the need to leave. Hayes could easily look like a lot of the other windswept former cattle towns that are scattered across the Great Plains, but about 50 years ago it made an unusual commitment, a commitment to the arts, that has helped it remain vibrant as the decades have passed. In October of 1965, two men, Vivian Meckel and Al Palmer, changed the destiny of their hometown by forming the first community arts council in the state, the Hayes Arts Council. This would prove to be the turning point of the town. The Hayes Arts Council began to weave the arts into the very fabric of the community, creating local galleries and art walks and helping to fund local artists' passions. And it all started with a cup of coffee. Vivian Meckel ran a local music store. And because he ran a music store, that also meant, of course, his relationship to Al Palmer from the music department was obviously very, very tight and connected. So they'd have coffee every day at the Brunswick Hotel. They were lamenting, you know, the attendance at this concert or the poor turnout for that. And wouldn't it be great if we had some sort of an entity, if we had a cohesive unit that could sort of help facilitate the development, the celebration, the acknowledgement of all these wonderful things that were going on. Hayes Arts Council was the very first one formed in the state of Kansas. The idea of a community arts group uh, sounded like a, a very necessary thing to do. Uh, there was a core of townspeople who joined with 40 state people, art people, and uh, there was a a wonderful energy and a, a need to bring culture to Hayes and to Western Kansas. And once we decided that we needed a large space, the former Hayes Daily News building was empty and deteriorating and needed to be saved. We really did initiate um, an interest in the center part of Hayes that had been neglected. I'd like to think that the fact that we have been here, that we've never stopped doing, 
that our efforts and our energy have remained constant and that you know we've we've kept touting the message I think maybe maybe that's been a benefit to downtown the standard of what was downtown there were still amazing places there's some of those are still here but it was a different downtown what we were staring at across the street wasn't the gorgeous galas and LB brewing it was a secondhand flea market kind of store that usually had stained mattresses sitting out front I like this way better Hayes has now become the epicenter for the arts in western Kansas, attracting world-renowned artists not only to display works in local galleries, but to stay and make a life. Pete Felton's role in our community and in arts across the state is, is legendary. It's absolutely legendary. When did you know you were going to be a sculptor? Well, I went out and got a rock and tried it, and I says, that's it, that's what I'm going to do. I didn't know I could do that. Been doing it ever since. And then you've got the other ones who choose us, like Chris Cooksey. I'm really am fortunate to have been in Hayes all those years. I think it's an interesting place because it has this sort of Wild West past to it, which I think is still there, you know. And I think the art walks are a good indication of that because for a town that tiny to have such a huge turnout, you know, it's really amazing. I'm Dennis Scheel. I've been an artist for, let's see, for about 22 years. Before that, I worked as an art director for Phelps Dodge in Denver and then worked in New York City. We had come to Hayes and the town has developed so much. The downtown area has just grown. Uh, it's, it's 10 times what I imagined, the, the support of the arts. And because of the Arts Council, because of all of them working together, the arts is amazing. Today, Hayes is a kind of creative mecca, providing venues for new and ambitious work by artists from all over the country. One of the largest draws to Hayes is the Spring Art Walk, which attracts locals and art lovers from across the Midwest. The Gallery Walk is very popular. It has grown and will continue to grow. It's amazing that this community has become very active in the arts. It's been wonderful that there has been the support of the community and we have been able to accomplish a tremendous amount of work. You know, the whole Arts Council thing started here and uh, it's, it's been going strong ever since. They just find good people to run it and there's a lot of artists and a great art department down at the college. Couldn't ask for more. My belief, as far as the arts and communities is, when people look at a community, if they can see that there's a strong arts and cultural base and an appreciation and a sense of respect and acknowledgement, it probably means everything else is taken care of. <laughs>